Welcome to the Heal Your Heartbreak podcast with your host, Breakup Bestie, aka me, Kendra. Breakups are hard, but you don't have to do it alone. Each week, I will be taking you through a different topic as it relates to breaking up, healing from heartbreak, growing in your single life, dating, and getting back into happier and healthier relationships. The goal of this show is to provide support, hope, tips, and to remind you that above all, this too shall pass. Welcome back to another episode of the Heal Your Heartbreak podcast. We are on episode 33, and I have two very special guests on the podcast today. I have Jan and Jillian, who are family mediators and co-parenting coaches. So the reason I wanted to bring them on is if you've been listening to this podcast, you know I'm such a big advocate of the no contact rule, but I'm also very sensitive to the fact that a lot of you guys have children with your ex and are dealing with co-parenting. So the no contact rule isn't necessarily applicable to you guys. And since I'm so big on speaking from my own personal experience and what I talk to you guys about, co-parenting is not something that I've had to deal with in past breakups. So I wanted to bring on some experts to be able to really get into this subject and give you guys the tips, the resources that you guys need to be able to successfully co-parent, go through this kind of breakup, um, while also being able to take care of yourself. So Jan and Jillian, welcome to the show. Thank Thank you for for having having us. us. Um, and I'll let them get into it, but they also happen to be sisters, which is amazing. So why don't you guys start off by telling a little bit about yourselves and then how you guys got started in this and then what do you guys help your clients with? So we got started in this because we were actually volunteering many moons ago with kids who ran away from home and started with doing family mediation over the phone and volunteering and helping kids and parents reunite and sort of um, get back to that family life and have a healthy relationship, which inspired us to go to grad school and get our master's in marriage and family therapy psychology. And then we went on to get certified um, in divorce and family mediation. And so um, just based on our education, we really just wanted to be able to help families, you know, be able to have you know, a healthy relationship. Also, we're children with divorce. So we've been through the whole process ourselves throughout our entire life. So between our personal and professional experience, we really want to be able to just help people, you know, heal through the process and after the process of divorce or separation. That's amazing. And I love that you, your guys's journey is such a personal one. And it comes from, you know, your personal experience. That's, you know, what I do, what I do is going through something and then being able to help other people do the same successfully. So love your guys's story and so happy to have you guys on today. Um, So my first question is when clients come to you, what are some of the biggest things that they're struggling with after a separation? So lately, a big topic that people keep coming to us for is co-parenting from different states or long-distance co-parenting or even COVID parenting um, is present right now just because um, of being able to take the safety and the health into concern for their children and environments they're being exposed to. But then also when you have long distance, it creates a whole nother dynamic and layer of the whole co-parenting relationship and really trying to stay connected to um, your children if you're not able to see them on a regular basis. Uh, I would say also dating, new dating partners has been coming up a lot because that's not something normally family court takes into consideration when creating parenting agreements if you go through the law route. Um, In terms of when we create parenting plans, we take into consideration the emotional, psychological development of the child and how dating again or bringing a new partner or step parent into the picture and how that really like works. Yeah, actually, I didn't even consider how, I mean, obviously, COVID has been an obstacle in so many ways in everyone's life, but I didn't even consider how that's been such an obstacle with, with co-parenting, especially if they're in different states. So what are some things that you are have been recommending to people on how they can still have an active role in their children's life when they can't see them on a regular basis with travel restrictions? So we recommend sort of having virtual play dates. Maybe it's like learning a musical instrument together 
or let's say let's have a pizza party. You send a pizza to their house and have a virtual pizza party. You could do karaoke and dance or virtual games, just something that's interactive with your children where you can still see each other face to face, but you're doing something to really build that connection and keep you know, honoring it while there might be a distance when you might see your child again. Oh, that's amazing. So there, it seems like there are always creative ways that, you know, you can still have that active relationship. It probably just takes a little bit more planning and and some creativity. So I love that you guys are helping people with that. So my main reason, and I mentioned in the intro of why I wanted to bring you guys on was, you know, I talk a lot about the no contact rule. It's probably one of the biggest things that I talk about, but obviously it's incredibly you know, it's incredibly helpful for those that can practice it. But for those that can't, I really wanted to have some alternative solutions um, with the no contact rule. So is there a version of the no contact rule that you guys help coach your clients on? So I think when it comes to communication and limiting your uh, contact with your ex, Try to focus on your communication, just being directly about the children and result, you know, whenever there's something that's coming up in terms of drop off or pick up times or medical, you know, education, those types of decisions, focus on just talking about the children when, when you do communicate. Also, we rec- recommend doing a weekly email, like pick a day of the week, like Tuesdays or Wednesdays, and then address any non-emergency issues in that email to sort of prevent that text messaging conversation back and forth as well. Wow. That's such a good, I didn't, I would never think of that. That's such a good alternative. And I've heard other people say like, you almost have to switch your relationship from romantic to almost like a business partnership because you guys have, I mean, it's not a business, but it, you know, kind of have that same kind of outlook on it. Yes. You're in the business of raising children together. So yeah, it does go from the romantic communication style to very business oriented because you just more or less want to stick to the facts in order to eliminate any of those emotional discord or any sort of old toxic relationship patterns that might have been present in the marriage or the relationship prior to the divorce or separation. Um, Eliminate that as much as possible coming back into the whole co-parenting dynamic. Yeah. So I have a couple of follow-up questions to that. The first one is if you know, someone's ex starts engaging in kind of emotional type conversations, how do you recommend them to deal with that? Is that like setting a boundary and being really direct about like what I can and cannot handle? Or how do you advise people with that? So if your ex is coming at you in an emotional way that just is overwhelming to you, give yourself time to calm yourself down because it might if it's triggering you before you respond because you want to be able to respond and not react and let you know because we don't want to show them or give them any more emotional ammunition that they might fire back at us and so getting yourself in that you know really calm collected state I think it's helps you know how to respond better but then also using like our 3c model which is a calm communication style um concise messaging and constructive language. And so when you're responding to someone who's coming at you, really just stick to the facts and avoid any personal attacks back because that's going to sort of put an end to that uh, emotional communication struggle that they're trying to put on you. And sometimes you can say, I'm sorry, you know, you're having a tough time. You know, maybe you want to talk about, you know, later, maybe we should talk about this topic later because it doesn't seem like right now is a good time. Or if you're trying to rekindle the romance as well, in terms of the connection, then you would want to set that boundary and let them know that, while I would love to have this conversation with you right now, I just, our relationship is not in that place. And I think it's best if we keep our emotional um, private, or our emotional life private from each other, because right now we just need to focus on what's best for our children. That's great. Yeah, I love those responses. And and I love that you touched on not reacting, but being able to calmly respond. And, you know, sometimes that involves not answering a text message right away, because you need to, you know, take care of yourself to be able to calm down before reacting to any kind of message like that. Um, My second follow up question to that was you mentioned like the toxic kind of behaviors that were probably already existent in the relationship before a separation. So 
do you guys recommend that they can like they try to continue to work on fixing that or is it just something where you just have to have a separation um, because it probably is extra painful to like try to work on relationship dynamics while they're working on separating if that makes sense well, the person, so if you have that empath and you know, more the manipulative type personality, when you usually that creates a lot of discord in the person who's generally the manipulative personality type, doesn't want to give up control over the empath um, ex-partner. So when you have that type of scenario, that's why it's going to be so important to have this business type of communication with your ex in order to eliminate getting sucked back into the whole toxic cycle of, um, pull you back in, push you away in terms of trying to have control over your life now in terms of moving forward. So. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And I know I have a lot of listeners who, who do have that empathic personality type and for whatever reason, the universe likes to pair empaths with <laughs> manipulators. <laughs> Some sick joke that the universe has liked to play on us. <laughs> Definitely. Well, the manipulator is actually a, usually a wounded, traumatic child that they have not worked through. So they love that empath. They love to attract that type of personality to take care of them because they have their own nurturing wounds they need to really face that they haven't yet faced in life. So. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of seeing your ex in person, so, you know, I know at some point there's probably some kind of goal where the family can be together for holidays or see each other like that. Is there a certain time that you say that people should not do those kinds of things in person before they can introduce that? I think it really depends where we're at in the process of the separation or divorce. Um, so we don't want to confuse the children either that and ha give them hope like we're getting back together. However, I think families can get together if the children are, you know, have an event that they're like a sporting event or a dance competition. I think that's can be a really great way to celebrate the children. But in terms of like holidays, we have to be really careful of how we do that. And I think it's better to separate in two separate homes than bring everyone together unless there's also significant other, you know, spouses or partners involved. Because otherwise, like I said, it gets really confusing for the children. And we want to have clear boundaries for the children so they understand and don't feel like we're, their parents are going to get back together again because that's just, they don't understand that yet, especially because it's an adult relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point to make considering that the holidays are coming up. And I know in, in most, if I understand correctly, in most legal separations, there is a division of holidays that typically takes place, correct? Right. Usually you flip back and forth in terms of every other holiday or someone has them on Christmas Eve, someone might have them on Christmas Day. So you take kind of turns in terms of the parenting time within the parenting uh, plan. Okay. And for, you know, I've had people in my life who have had separations, Not ne they're not necessarily even legally married, but they do share children together. And I know in the past I've seen where they don't, they don't necessarily take the legal route and they just kind of base it on like, oh, we're just going to have this agreement. What advice do you give to people who might not necessarily want to take the legal route because they think they'll be able to just handle it without getting other people involved? They definitely don't have to go to court and take the legal route. Um, you, the, you're better off settling outside of court you can by going through a family mediator. And, but I do recommend definitely having a parenting plan because that allows things to be very clear and straightforward. And that way we don't have any sort of uh, miscommunication or misunderstanding of who's responsible for what because it will outline um, responsibilities for medical, uh, schooling, extracurricular activities who has the children, um, you know, what days of the week and everything like that. So it does really help eliminate a lot of unnecessary um, conflictual communication that could potentially be brought up if there's not a solid parenting plan. And that can be done outside of court very easily. And a lot of reasons too, people get a divorce is because of financial issues. And so having financial um, commitments in terms of co-parenting is something that needs to be talked about so everyone's clear in terms of how they're contributing to the children's well-being financially. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And 
so part of you know, a breakup is the person who's going through the breakup needs a certain amount of space to be able to allow their hearts to heal, allow all the feelings to come up. And how do you recommend people to create that space while they're still having to be in contact with their ex? They're having to go through all of these, you know, mediation or courts or whatever path they decide to go to. How do you guys, you know, coach people into creating that self-care kind of space so they can heal from the breakup? Whether you're going through a breakup or not, to be honest, like self-care and self-love is vital to your overall lifestyle and well-being as an individual in terms of our growth and development. Um, I always like to think that we're always going to be on this path of growth, uh, no matter where we're at in life. But it is very important when you are going through a breakup in order to keep you feeling um, stable and feeling great uh, about yourself. But a lot of um, individuals coming out of especially toxic relationships, their self-worth, their self-esteem is confidence is completely shattered and so really having that um daily routine of self-care and self excuse me self-love exercises is really vital in order to help you process those emotions and that can be done through journaling meditation um self-care would be more like going to the gym eating healthy but really nurturing your self-love i think is the most important thing which seems to be misconstrued in society as self-care where self-love is about mentally doing what we need to do that work in order to feel better to move on emotionally. And also, too, implementing self-care and self-love, you can teach your children to do that as well because it's you want to be able to be the best parent. You have to be able to pour from a full cup. And so if you feel like, you know, you have been working all day, helping children with their homework, and you have dinner, and then you feel like, oh, I still haven't done anything for myself – you know, do some yoga together, do deep belly breathing. Children need to be able to do these activities too. And the sooner they start implementing, you know, some of these self-help tools, they're going to feel better too, because they need that support as well going through this process. Yeah. Well, you guys are totally speaking my language. That's exactly what I recommend to people, you know, going through a breakup. And it's been important for me in breakups, single, in a marriage, like oh, taking care of myself has been vital in every area of my life. The one thing that I know a lot of moms deal with is they have that that guilt of, you know, I need to take care of my children and I always need to come last. And you you talked about that, but how do you how have you helped people shift that perspective of I just need to take care of my kids, I come last versus if I take care of myself, I'm going to be better able to take care of my kids. So I think it goes back to just helping them understand that they're worthy of love and being able to be kind and compassionate to themselves. And so recommitting to who they are can really help them start to honor and put themselves first. And once again, if you're feeling stressed out, how are you going to be able to help your child? You might be short fused and then your children are going to feel that. So it's just really important to understand that like you have to come first if you want to be able to serve others and help others and be that best parent as well. So, you know, even getting up before the kids get up for school, you know, a lot of times parents will get up, you know, 30 minutes, an hour early, or, you know, even when, once the kids have been bathed and fed, you know, before you go to bed is another time really. So the end of the day or beginning of the day, just finding that time for yourself, you know, and it only takes 15 to 20 minutes. It doesn't have to be, you know, a full on 45 minutes an hour, just carving out those, that little 15 minutes can do wonders for your own self esteem and self worth. Yeah. And I even think that sometimes people just need like a week of doing it to see the benefits and then they're probably more motivated to, to continue that on their own. And I think another form of the self-love and self-care is honoring your feelings, especially after going through a breakup. So obviously after going through a breakup, we feel very emotional. We have a lot of feelings that come up. We're very hurt, you know, angry, all of those things that come up. How do you, you know, coach people to be able to honor their feelings, have their feelings, have their cries while still, you know, living in the same house as their children and not wanting to necessarily overexpose them to all of that? But how do you have them, you know, work that in? Do they talk to their kids about their feelings or do they just keep it private? What's the best, you know, method you've found for that? I really think it depends on the age of the children. We don't want to displace adult 
struggles and emotions onto our children because they're not in a position to handle that. It's not fair to them to give them all the emotional baggage to deal with. And then children will tend to internalize it and blame themselves for the separation or the divorce. So we really need to be cautious of how emotional we are in front of the children. We don't need to be robots by any means, but if you're having, you know, several, you know, emotional breakdowns a day, it's something that it's telling me that you're neglecting yourself and you really need to take that time to figure out what's going to help you work through this process emotionally so the children are not impacted by it. Um, writing down like your feelings on paper. So let's say your children's doing their homework and, you know, in the kitchen and, or in the living room and then you have a notebook, just writing your feelings on paper can sometimes get it out of you without feeling like you need to like really oh really express or talk about it, but just writing it on paper and then sometimes ripping it up can feel like a sense of relief and a release, you know, getting things out of you just so you're not keeping it in and internalizing it yourself and feeling like you have to, you know, hold on to everything and try to be this strong person at all times in front of your children. Cause we are humans at the end of the day and we connect and sometimes we can just tell our children, mommy's having a tough day or daddy's having a tough day, you know, just let them know that it's okay that not every day has to be rainbows and sunshine, but we can also have times where we just need to have some space to breathe and just, you know, even get your kids involved and do some deep breathing together. Just let them know, like, you know, this is how we can all heal as a family. I love that. That's so powerful. And I think too, one of the big issues in divorce is when there's resentment and how do we not transfer that resentment to, you know, the kids. And I know there's like very blatant forms of it where, you know, parents are bad mouthing the other parent to their kids, which obviously should not be doing, but I'm sure there's also probably a little bit more subtle ways that that happens. How have you seen that happen? And how do you, you know, help people to not transfer that kind of anger and resentment to the kids? So I think when it comes to that, we have to ask ourselves, like, what are our intentions of bad-mouthing the other parent to the child? What kind of role model are we as a parent teaching our children about either gossiping or talking poorly? And so I think at the end of the day, we have to think about the values we want to instill in our children and know that sometimes we don't have to necessarily like everybody, but we also don't need to also share something negative about the person. We can be indifferent or have a neutral stance and just, you know, make peace and be amicable, even if it's not someone we want to necessarily, you know, be talking great about because we have these negative, angry feelings towards them. So I think, you know, just being able to um, acknowledge that, like, we don't have to like our ex, but it's also our children's, you know, parents. So we need to be respectful of our children and children want to be respected at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that can be such a big issue in going through divorces. And I'm probably at the end of the day, like you don't want to isolate, you want your kid to have both parents if possible. And so not wanting to cut someone off or, you know, create this villain out of a person just because you guys didn't get along. It doesn't mean that they're a bad person. It doesn't mean, you know, that they're, that they shouldn't, you know, that they can't be a really good parent at the end of the day. So I think that's really, really powerful. So I think everyone's biggest fear after going through a breakup is that their ex is going to start dating someone new. So when, you know, when you find out that, you know, your child's, you know, father or mother is starting to date other people, how do you help guide people on not taking it, either not taking it personally or not like falling to pieces because of it? When it comes to um, new partners coming into the picture, usually we recommend in your parent agreement that you set a timeline with your co-parent of how long you're going to date somebody prior to introducing them to the children. Um, if you start dating someone and you're not introducing them to the children, then it should not even be uh, on any sort of discussion with your co-parent. It's not any of their business. This is your new private life. And I recommend you keep it as your new lifestyle and your new life outside of, um, you have plenty of time usually to spend time in your dating life when you're not, you know, parenting. So usually we recommend at least making sure this person's going to be a more of a permanent fixture in your life before you introduce them to the children. Um, that timeline can be different from everybody. 
uh, definitely usually six months or a year in terms of before bringing them into the picture and introducing them to the children. Now, obviously, sometimes you have the more manipulative type personalities who start usually dating somebody right away because they're seeking that, um, trying to overcome that void they already internally feel within themselves and they need that external validation. So sometimes that person is not going to be as respectful as a co-parent, um, but that's why we recommend in your parenting agreement some, having some sort of language that says what that timeline looks like before introducing new partners. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really important. And, and also that helps. Cause I, you know, I think my biggest advice for people is to not find out just to not find out that your ex is dating someone new, like trying to protect yourself from that information as much as possible, which leads me to a question about social media. So typically I tell people like cut, you know, cut it off, but I'm sure with, you know, you probably want to see the pictures that your ex is posting of your kids. So how do you help people navigate that whole concept of social media? So I think when it comes to like social media, I think you have to decide what works for you because sometimes you can be triggered based on someone's, you know, your ex posting things of your children or you know, and that's going to upset you. So you might be the type of person who just wants to eliminate all social media contact and unfriend them just until you're in that place where it no longer triggers you. And some people are okay with keeping that um, tie and they're not bothered by or triggered by because they want to know what's going on. But also don't keep going back and stalking your ex's profile if you plan to stay in contact because all you're doing is preventing your healing process and re- you're opening those wounds to the point that you're going to stay stuck much longer in that process of unhealed because you're constantly just reopening that room. You can't actually heal when you constantly keep going back to your ex's profile. It's just nearly impossible. Yes. And actually the episode I just released this last week is called Stop Playing the Investigator of, you know, digging into all your ex's stuff and, you know, everything is social media now. So it's, you can literally see anything that someone's up to. So I think that's a really important point to make. And I, I wonder, just in general, what kind of differences do you see in terms of the partners of the one who ended the relationship and then the one who had the relationship ended on them? Do you coach people differently depending on that? Or what are some of the big differences that you see with that? I wouldn't say we coach any individual differently versus if they've been left or they're the one who left their partner, because even if they're, so usually that person who's been left, there struggling to typically let go of that relationship and the vision that they had for their life with that person and what it was going to look like is usually what they're struggling most to let go of. Where if you have somebody who decided to leave a partner, um, sometimes they're left with that guilt that they that they shouldn't have left the partner because then they feel bad for the children. So even though you might be dealing with different feelings or different um, ways of like letting go of that relationship at the same time, you're still kind of doing the same work along the way. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. And, and how do you help people? You know, I get questions a lot of people feeling the guilt of ending a relationship, even without children involved. So how do you help people you know, assure them that, you know, I always tell people like, it's very hard to end a relationship. So if you did it, it's probably for a very good reason that you walked away from it. And then I imagine with children, it's even more. So how do you assure people that they did make the right decision and that, you know, it, it's more, it was more helpful to end the relationship on their children versus staying in a relationship where they were unhappy? So we help people go back to their value system to identify what their top five values are to help them see that they were not being able to, they weren't in alignment with their partner because our emotional needs are tied to our value system. And so our emotional needs are not going to be met if the person isn't aligned, let's say on communication or integrity or faithfulness, you know, honesty. And so if we know what our value system is and our partner doesn't meet, you know, three out of the five of those values, more than likely it's not going to be a healthy relationship. So we can look at that from a place of more logic and rationale versus the emotional component and identify that 
if I want to have a healthy, thriving, you know, relationship or marriage, I have to be able to have a partner that's going to align with my values because that's how I'm going to thrive and have someone who respects me, honors, honors me and values me in their life. If you like what you hear on this podcast and you want more, you can work with me directly using my courses. No matter where you feel stuck in your breakup recovery, there is going to be a course for you. With the Breakup Emergency First Aid Kit, you can jumpstart your healing process right after a breakup if you feel lost and you feel like the world has just been ripped out from underneath you. With the Detox Your Ex course, we'll go through the no contact rule and how to start detoxing your ex from your life and from your obsessive thoughts. In Breakthrough Your Breakup, we'll dig into the feelings, resentments, anger, and your relationship in general so you can walk away from it with a feeling of peace. Lastly, in Moving On After Heartbreak, we'll get you prepared to go out and meet your dream partner without that fear of getting hurt again. And if you want all of these, or like I call it, the whole shebang, you can still purchase Heal Your Breakup course, which will go through everything I just listed and more. And for my podcast listeners, you can still use the code PODCAST for the full course and get $25 off. Head to the link in my show notes to take the quiz and find out which course is best for you so you can start moving on, healing, and feeling happy again. And for a limited time, you'll also get my 90-day breakup journal for free as a bonus. If you listen to this show, you know how much I love journaling and how important it is. So head to the show notes to start your healing journey with me. Now back to the show. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's typically what I, you know, coach people to do too is take is, you know, I think we tend to, when we look back on relationships we either see all the bad or all the good. And when we're going through a breakup, we typically, our minds tend to point to all of the great things. So we start thinking like, okay, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't have done this. It wasn't that bad, all of those things. So I love that you have people go through their values and what do they really want in a relationship. And then, you know, if you do that, you can objectively look like this is what I want and this is what it was. Those things are either going to match or they're not going to match. And I think- you know, especially if people are going through the work of maybe going to couples therapy or doing all the things to try to change it and nothing's changing at the end of the day. Some people are just, you know, not going to change, you know, really big things in their life like that. I think in those initial stages, it can be really hard to look at, you know, the pros and cons of why they left. And, you know, obviously they had to make a, they made that choice for a reason. And I think sometimes we need to start doing some positive affirmations and gratitudes that make us feel good about our choices and learn to trust ourselves instead of thinking that because we can't trust ourselves to make choices or decisions, then it's going to be very challenging to move forward in life. So reminding ourselves that we are, you know, a great person, that we have a lot of you know, we weren't valued at some point in time. So we need to realize we are a valuable person. And I think just doing some daily affirmations and gratitudes can really help us remember, you know, who we are, you know, who we were before all the like emotional and toxic abuse. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think especially with people that are empaths, I know, you know, in my own experience, I tend to really lose, I tended to really lose myself in relationships and everything that I thought I existed by was wrapped up with this person. So at the end of the relationship, when it ended, it was like, what's left? Like, I felt like everything was tied up with this person. And so really having to dig in and figure out like, who am I? What do I like? What, you know, who was I before this relationship? And I think that's something I try to remind people of is like breakups are actually can be a really amazing opportunity to dig into ourselves and get to know ourselves again and, and grow because I, I tend to think we're very motivated by pain. So when we have that much pain as fuel, we have this great motivation to, to do the work on ourselves. So I think all, everything that you guys are recommending with affirmations, gratitude, you know, deep breathing, meditation, it's all, it's all going to pay off you know, even years and years from now when you're not even thinking about the breakup. Oh, absolutely. And I know you mentioned before that sometimes it takes people to week. Yeah. 
Um, I just want to touch on that because sometimes people oh, nowadays, we think everything is instant gratification immediately in terms of we're going to feel better. It's in, it's like, it's not like popping, you know, like a pill or aspirin to get rid of a headache and it's going to go away. Doing these sort of self love and self care, it does take time, but you will reap the benefits in your life in so many different ways in terms of how it impacts you. You just have to be patient and allow the process to take place, but it will happen. And not to mention some of the work that we do after breakups actually feels more painful at first because we are like kind of pulling the covers on some of really tough feelings that we're going through. So I think that can freak people out at first. It's like, oh no, I'd rather just like cover this up and pretend it didn't happen and and just try to move on business as usual. But, you know, going through that is just pays off so tremendously um, in the future, no matter, you know, where the life takes you. Right. We have to feel if we want to heal because if we avoid it and shove it under the rug somewhere down the line, it's going to explode like a volcano in our life. And so you're better off if you, you know, go through the, all the painful emotions now and you will be in a much better place than if you were just to like avoid it and not, you know, focus on it. Also, I think too, it's like we want to, you know, break that path or that cycle of constantly entering toxic relationships. And so we have to ask ourselves, like, what is our relationship goal? What is it that we really want and desire with a partner? Because we know if we've been down this pattern a few times, we're going to end up in a breakup again. So if we don't want to keep going through that, this is the time now to like unleash your like feminine inner self-worth and just like give it your all and knowing that there's going to be you know we know we can't if we don't work uh, excuse me so we know we're always working hard at something there's always going to be a reward so taking that risk is like going to be the biggest gift to yourself exactly it's like what's the worst that could happen like you end up really you know feeling very worthy and very confident in yourself like there's not really there's not really a downside to doing the work it's not fun all the time and a lot of it can be painful but um especially when it comes to breaking relationship patterns i share on my podcast that i got dumped three times in a row in two and a half years cuz the guy didn't want to get married and i'm like and finally i was like oh i think this might be a pattern that i'm like going after really emotionally unavailable people but it wasn't until i like paused and did the work and looked at myself that i realized like oh i'm doing something that's bringing those people into my life it has to do with the fact that like i don't think i'm marriage material i don't have great self esteem so i'm attracting people who don't want to take the commitment to that next step so really being able to turn inward and not to say that's like it's always your fault or it's always completely your fault but i do believe we always have a part in terms of who we're bringing into our lives. Absolutely. I think, you know, relationships are about two people, but we do need to take responsibility for our part and our belief system is what leads to our behavior. So, you know, if there's something that we're contributing or doing, there's a reason why we keep showing up the same way and attracting those types of partners because what we mirror to that outside world is what we're going to attract back in into our inner world. So I think a lot of times we do have to say, where can I make changes? What life lesson am I supposed to be learning with this breakup in this relationship? What, what am I going to gain from this? And I think one of my biggest like love lessons was just learning how to use my inner voice and set healthy boundaries from the beginning. So that way I didn't end up in another bad relationship, you know, because if you don't speak up, you're going to constantly be walked all over. Absolutely. And I just have, I have, I was just thinking, I have to give you guys kudos, but how full spectrum you guys are in terms of helping your clients is so incredible. Like not just doing parenting plans, but also the inner work. So I just was just thinking that. So I wanted to to share that with you guys. I think what you're doing is unbelievable in terms of, you know, being able to help the whole person and not just, you know, dealing with the the divorce because it is, you know, a full spectrum thing we have to deal with. It is a full spectrum thing in terms of how it impacts your life. I mean, you're having to recreate your whole entire lifestyle almost. And you might have a different career or you might be working for the first time in your life. You might be having to move to a new home, a new town. Like there's so many different transformations that happen when you're going through a separation or a breakup um, that it is a really huge life transformation and how it impacts every aspect of your life. And it's a great time to, like you said, look inward and figure out 
what is it that I want now for my life? Where do I see my life going? And it's, yeah, while it's about the children in terms of that co-parenting business relationship, it's really a transformation within who you are as a person because now is the time to create that life you've always wanted. Yeah, and such a great opportunity to set a really good role model for kids. Like, hey, we're always growing. We're always learning. Like, it never stops. We always get to, you know, continue to work and improve instead of just saying, like, we get to this point and then we're done, you know? So I think it's such a cool thing to be able to have your kids, you know, watch you go through something tough and come out on the other side, just such a beautifully changed person. Yeah, they really do learn a lot by watching the behaviors of their parents. Um, so it may not be what the parents are saying to the children, but they're all always observing behavior. So they will be observing how you have handled the discord with the co-parent, how you emotionally um, got yourself back together and kept pushing forward in life. And they will see that as a strength and they will look up to you for that. Yeah. I feel like I could talk to you guys for forever. I do have two <laughs> final questions that came directly from. Um, people on my Instagram, um, when I told, said I was interviewing you guys. So the first one was if the ex starts becoming like a bully, like whether they're like withholding money or like being super nasty, do you guys recommend that someone like you, like a mediator, like gets involved or what kind of options does someone have if it tur- if the ex turns really nasty and starts doing things like that? So I think when it comes to someone who's being very emotionally, verbally abusive, it might be good to hire a co-parenting coach who can help you navigate those conversations and help you strategically find a solution to communicate in a way that we can try to understand how come they're resisting, you know, financial means of, you know, when it comes to um, child support, a lot of times, you know, those are things that need to be met for the in sake of the children. And so I think what we need to do is figure out like how to structure that conversation. And sometimes if we can bring them on together. So even we have virtually working with our clients, we can have one co-parent in their home, another co-parent in their home. They don't even have to like necessarily be in the same, you know, vicinity on the couch together, but they're in their own private space where we can actually help them navigate those conversations to sort of resolve whatever the animosity or resentment is as to why they're trying to bully the other person. But then we also teach the person who's experiencing the bullying how to set boundaries for themselves, how to honor what it is that they need so they don't get wrapped up in that emotional abuse cycle. Yeah, because it's it's really easy to disfuse the person who's very um, aggressive or defensive if you know the proper language to use. And when you know how to communicate with that person, it breaks down their defenses right away when they realize you're not going to add fuel to the fire and battle back and forth with them. That's, um, that's incredible. I feel like I wish I really knew that when I was in a very toxic relationship because it, I feel like it is true. Like the more you give them back, the more fuel that they have to lay it back on you. So sometimes it's just like, I'm not going to participate in this. And that kind of immediately diffuses the person because they don't get that same satisfaction that they would get in the past. So sometimes if someone's coming at you, if an ex is coming at the co-parent and it's becoming a personal issue, just you might want to say, but ask them, we always call it discovery questions and ask them a question back. Can you help me understand how this is beneficial to parenting our children? Because again, that is what the focus of your relationship is today is about parenting of the children and it's no longer about you and them. And they're trying to create some sort of toxic controlling manipulative behavior to bring you back down if they see you glowing up in your life and they don't like it and so but when you ask a discovery question and you put it back on them it helps refocus the conversation and lets them know that what they're trying to do is not going to work that's incredible I love that I love that um and then my last question is so this was another question that came from someone and it has to do with you know, obviously when we're in a relationship, we're physically attracted to the person. And I find that after a breakup, we logically know that the relationship's over, but it sometimes takes like our body and our heart and probably our hormones some time to catch up to, um, to what the reality of the situation is. So how do you suggest people start separating the emotional and the physical attraction that they have towards their ex when they still have to, you know, talk to them or see them at drop off and things like that? 
I think the biggest thing is start putting your energy into finding a new hobby, creating your new lifestyle. Also focus on your children. Try to not keep focusing on them because the more you focus on your ex, the more your those sensations and feelings are going to rise. And so if you're not adding energy to something, it's less likely going to die down because then we're not going to keep nurturing that connection or relationship that we once, you know, are still desired, but we're trying to help ourselves um, remove ourselves away by just giving back to ourselves and nurturing our, the relationship with ourselves can be really helpful to help dissolve that attachment. Yeah. I feel like the the moral of the episode is to just continue focusing on you, your own self-care, your own self-love, just kind of stay. I love the saying, like, stay in your own hula hoop. So, um, So I feel like that's a great moral of the episode and something that I feel like I teach a lot as well. So how can people find you? How can people work with you? If you could share, you know, how people can find you after this episode and I'll put it all in the show notes as well, but. Uh, they can shoot us a DM always on Instagram at Divorce Family Mediations, or you can visit our website at divorcefamilymediations.com and set up a consult with us. Um, every consult is complimentary, so we can learn more about you and your um, situation and how we can help you get to a healthier and happier space in your life. Amazing. And I know, did you guys, was it I could be imagining this. Did you guys just have like a guidebook that you recently came out with or like an ebook kind of a thing? We have a um, guide that they can download on healing to happier times in their life. So it gives some self-care, self-love tips, also some co-parenting boundaries. Um, I think there's activities in there for children as well that are going through divorce. So it's a plethora of lots of little goodies in there. Amazing. Well, thank you guys so much. I know everyone listening to this is um, very appreciative of you guys. And so definitely go follow them on Instagram. I'll be tagging them when this episode comes out. So please go check them out. And again, thank you guys. And I really, really appreciate everything that you shared on here. Great. (laughs) Thank you so much for having us. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you loved it, I hope you'll leave me a review and share with your friends. If you're interested in learning more about my course, Heal Your Breakup, where I take you step-by-step through my entire healing process, you can find more info at my website, breakupbestie.com. And if you're new, don't forget to join our private Facebook group so you can connect with other women going through the same thing and seek support. You can search Breakup Bestie Support Group on Facebook to join. Lastly, if you're not already following me on Instagram, I share new tips and support every single day. You can find me at your breakup bestie. Most importantly, hang in there, stay connected with loved ones, be nice to yourself, and remember it's all going to be okay. I promise.